On this podcast, you'll find interviews with high-performing, successful individuals in life sciences. On a weekly basis, we cover their proven methods, principles, strategies, and mindsets to implement new technologies that scale to meet the needs of people in our world. Hello and welcome to the Life Science Success Podcast. My name is Don and I'm your host. I also am the president and principal of 5280 Life Sciences Consulting and our focus is on helping clients that are trying to scale with services that will help them succeed. I have an ultimate guide to OKRs. If you're looking to implement metrics in your organization, this is an excellent way to learn how to do it and how to overcome barriers in your organization. With that, on the Life Science Success Podcast, my guest today is going to be Lori Schloff. Lori is a lifelong corporate communications coach to professionals who are speaking as a t- who use speaking as a tool for success and results. She specializes in developing valuable programs for financial and biotech fields. So welcome with welcome Lori. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. I love your show. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, I greatly appreciate that. And uh yeah, I tried I've tried really hard to just make sure that people have an opportunity uh to, you know, just see what's out there in terms of the the things that are in life sciences and communication is so important for everybody I feel like in this in this field. So, yeah, thanks totally. so much for being here. Yeah, there, I mean there's a huge relationship between success and one's communication abilities. And that's really at every level, you know, with within your team obviously with clients, because when they decide whether to partner with you or the company down the street, right. often the decisive factor is who, who do they find most clear? Who do they find um, most, most approachable? Uh, definitely in terms of the career ladder, the higher up you go, the more your speaking and communication abilities matter. And I love my life sciences people. And the reason is simple. They're doing great things. <laughs> yeah. So I, I actually just, I mean, just earlier this afternoon, I was talking to somebody who has an early stage drug that's just getting ready to head into clinical trials. And um, so, you know, great to, uh, you know, help companies that are at that phase. And then also, you know, companies that are looking for investment, they've got to be able to break down the communication into a level that people can more or less connect with, right? And that's that, that that's the biggest challenge that I continually see in the field is that yeah. you know most people struggle with that with that aspect of it. Yeah, it's it's like a different headset being a scientist, being a researcher, and then having to talk to people who don't have that mindset. And they're so important to you. You you, you need their their dollars, their advice, their business advice, and you do have to learn a different way of communicating when you're not, you know, for example, you might start with the big picture, not the facts. You might leave out details and that, that feels really uncomfortable to some of my scientists and researcher clients. Yeah. It's funny because I I've seen um, there's like consultant models where they show like a, uh, almost like a pyramid, right. Of, of communication. Like you're leading somebody towards the, an upside down, pyramid towards the point, um, you know, that way where you're starting sort of, you know, wide or broad and then, you know, kind of, you know, honing people in, but there's, it's so hard, I would imagine to go from that whenever you're, whenever you have more of the details. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it makes sense if you're a scientist and you've been researching a cause of, you know, childhood liver cancer for, for a decade, you're dying to share the, the details. Uh, but the investor really just wants to hear what the bottom line is. So it's it's different. And you know what? It's not for everyone. So people do have to carefully consider if, if they're going to go uh, from medicine or research or science or academia into the corporate world. It's a, it's, those are some of the things to think about. It's a different way of looking at what you do. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. So um, I kind of started and jumped right into your topic being communications. But I mean, would you mind just sharing a little bit of of the details about yourself with our audience? Sure. So you would call me a corporate communication coach. I focus on helping people to use how they come across. And some of those elements are 
how they message, how they structure and organize, the wording they use, then delivery, which refers to your visual image, your nonverbal behavior. You have no idea, Don, how difficult it is to get people to look into the camera when they're talking. Well, maybe you do know. Right. <laughs> um, and then there's the oral image. I'm actually a speech pathologist by training. So how people sound is also a very important factor, the ability to hold attention. And by the way, that's another issue with some of my researchers. They don't want to sound enthusiastic. Why? It's the opposite of clinical. Uh. So it, it, for, for 25 years, someone has sounded kind of, you know, very low key. And all of a sudden, in order to keep an investor's attention, they have to sound different. Yeah. And for some people, it's a pretty easy transition because they lean that way anyway, personality wise. And for others, it's very challenging. Yeah, it's funny because I have I have friends that have to do video quite often um, in other industries and um, and they have to do this whole thing to like hype themselves up before they before they get in front of the camera. Um, you know, what you see right now is this is me. So I, I, I haven't, you know, sort of hyped myself up or anything like that before I got on camera. But I, I'm naturally, I would say, curious about a lot of the people that I interview. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and just, well, you also have good facial expression, again, which is the opposite of, uh, let's say, working with a physician. I work mm -hmm. with many physicians who go into business and they often, not always, do lack some facial expression because they don't want their face to give away bad news, let's say. I'm just giving that as an example. Right. Yes, I have a bit of that poker face <laughs> as well. Right, which, um, doesn't, can, which, which isn't great for the two elements you want to convey are competence, which usually is no problem with the people in life scientists, sciences, and warmth. So our research in our field, which has been going on now for at least, at least, 50, 60 years indicates that those two elements always come into play. Are you likable and are you competent? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that the, the speech pathology part, because I, I sort of frequently on this podcast, there are things that I flub just quite often. And um, I sort of tell everybody that if you're listening here, you're going to get this pretty often for me because it's just naturally me. Uh, and I typically don't go back and, and edit it out or anything like that as well. But the, the Northwest Indiana part of me also makes me struggle a little bit with certain putting certain words or syllables together as well. And so it's just, I mean, people get me as a part of the, the show here and it's just kind of how it goes. Well, I think you have a lot of strengths going for you. Uh, and <laughs> yes, you. We do speak like uh, people where we grew up, and you know that's called a dialect, and that's a whole a whole field. That's a whole show in and of itself. There's <laughs> prejudice for and prejudice against certain dialects. Uh, sure. So you know, if a client comes to me with a British accent, you know he could be spewing nonsense, and it sounds very very classy. <laughs> Yeah, I tell I tell people that too. That you know, oftentimes I feel like uh, the British accent, you know, um, seems to raise your overall IQ, whether or not if, if it is That's making sense or not. It. Just... <laughs> That's a really good way to put it. So, so. but you know, it's a controversial topic because you know we we do want to appreciate diversity, but we also want to be understood. So I do work with a fair number of non-native speakers of English who want to be more clear, better understood. Uh yeah, makes sense. So what put you in this field? Gosh, it's a lifelong interest in, I guess, the combination of three things, communication, uh, helping people, and also uh, creativity, because I get to customize programs for for teams and individuals. And I, I like using my noodle that way, <laughs> but, you know, solving the puzzle of what's going to be most helpful to a particular person or team. Yeah. Are there are, in life sciences, do you find that there are, I mean, cause you've said, you know, people being very focused on the, on the science, but are there certain things um, other than associating yourself with a part of their success that, you know, really makes you want to work in this, in this field or with these clients? 
I haven't met one client in the life sciences who wasn't really, really motivated and mm -hmm. what motivates them and that that's great for a coach. I mean, I do have colleagues who like working with difficult people. Count me out. <laughs> I'm not interested in that. I, at this stage of my career, I only work with people who really want to improve. And I think what what's happening with most of my clients in life sciences is, it, is they're extending their comfort zone. So they were comfortable presenting at a conference. Um, they're comfortable maybe leading an internal team that they know well. But when it comes to speaking to a board, that might be new. Mm -hmm. Or obviously we've talked about uh, raising money, a road show that can feel really, really new. Having to defend yourself <laughs> without being disagreeable right. can feel really, really new. And also just having to have this this presence, mm. you know, that might, you know, I, I've worked with a few scientists this year who they were, it, it was, okay, I'm going to be, I'm, I hope this isn't obnoxious, but they, they were practically Nobel Prize winners being nerds. Uh. But, but having that image isn't that comfortable for a lot of people who are going to invest in them. Sure. So, so I hope I didn't offend anyone. I I mean I I love people who love what they do. I'm a, I'm a speech geek nerd myself, so <laughs> it can happen in any field. Yeah, I think I I think there are a lot of us that can can yeah. be nerds with regards to different different aspects of different things. I think though, um, I guess the one thing I also would associate a little bit of what you what I hear you saying is that. Um, you know, again, people may, might be a little bit too close to the thing that they're trying to focus on um, and just needing to be able to convey that message out as well as is so critical. Um, what put you in this in this field? Why, why do you focus on financial and biotech fields? Well, I think a lot of times when you have success with a certain group, that group gravitates towards you. Mm. So people in my kind of field, what we do is we have, I would call it uh, projects. So recently I had a big project with Biogen and I have another big pro project with Johnson and Johnson. So then word of, you know, you get to know your clients really well. So it's sort of word of mouth. And if you love working with a certain field and they like you as well, then it, it, it tends to build. Yeah. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's one of those things where I've found that you know, word of mouth of one client definitely you know sort of helps to lead to the next one as well. And and um, you know, also once you've built once you've built the relationship and people know what to expect from you, it's it's a lot easier to find uh, additional work you know at any one client as well. I completely agree. Yeah, and again, just going back to what I said, I feel very blessed that. I'm helping people to communicate about things that are uh, so very important. Yeah. And so um, what sort of things does your company partners in communication um, do with clients? Okay. So maybe I'll give um, a couple of examples. One very comprehensive program I did recently for a healthcare related company, not necessarily life sciences called Commonwealth Care Alliance. Uh, they're involved in all sorts of programming uh, for low-income folks uh, in many states in the United States. Anyway, so the leaders wanted the managers to be better at what they called executive briefings. So they had me develop a program called Communicating for Impact and Influence. And just again, you asked me, you know, what I do. So I created a whole video series for them. They they would watch it before they came to the live. I shouldn't say live, the virtual class, and then we would practice. Okay. And then they would do peer coaching with each other. And of course, the goal was to implement the strategies, organizing your thoughts, influencing, running meetings. Well, that's a hot one. <laughs> How to have engaging meetings where everyone's included. I did that program today. Obviously, the goal is for the company to see results that meetings are better presentations are better senior people are very happy because everyone is be brief be bright be gone you know give me the bottom line and 
overall, what I do is very visible. It is not mysterious. So it's not unusual, Don, for me to meet someone on a Monday who has a big talk on a Friday and to get a text that they did much better, uh, you know, because they practiced and had the coaching. So is most of your work virtual or do you do in-person coaching as well? Pre-COVID, I would say it was half and half mm -hmm. or maybe skewed more towards <laughs> running around Boston and running around the country. Uh, I've elected to be 90% Zoom. Now, if a client says to me, like Biogen recently said, they want to have their people in person and do an offsite. Of course, you know, I will I'd be delighted to travel, but I feel I feel like for some reason in my field, the virtual coaching works we very well. And a theory I have is in a field like communication, kind of being really close to someone, like really seeing you up close is very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, 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 so the one, the, the, as you were going through a bit of your discussion on the, on the training that you've done, um, the one thing that I remember somebody did for me years ago was they, they had to sort of prepare a talk and then go be video recorded. And I remember how terrifying that absolutely was <laughs> getting in front of a camera. I was like, I'll take a room for, you know, room of a hundred people or more any day of the week. And, you, you know, not don't aim this camera at me. But then now I find it interesting that, you know, almost all the time, just like now, you know, we're having conversations with the camera more or less. Um, yeah. And you're, you've become so good. You're so comfortable, so steady. You're <laughs> obeying the three S's. So my, my field's all about technique. So the three S's are take up space, be stable. Every movement is purposeful and be symmetrical. So symmetrical means that you're your beard is even with <laughs> your body. Even now, with my shirt. Wrong with tilting your head occasionally, right. you know. But for influence, we do want to be centered. So you're obeying the three S's. Little did you know. Little did I know. Yeah, and then I mean, the reason why I asked about the in presence thing is that I've I've also been a part of like larger corporate communication events, both with General Electric and then uh, you know one other one with a kind of you know other group that had you know a group of five thousand people that they wanted to get energized before Whoa. the main speaker hit hit the stage, and the one individual that had that job of energizing the crowd came out and almost was like me, you know, talking on stage and they were like, yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> so, so they, you know, get, they hired him a, a, a communications coach more or less to, you know, this is what you've got to do to get people amped up. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the big thing. Well, people in my field though joke because we're getting so many requests to help to have people be better at running virtual meetings, but we know meetings before they were virtual were, were not good. I mean, right. research on meetings in the meeting science field, and there is there is a field called meeting science, is frankly pathetic that most people do not find meetings valuable. They're going to too many meetings. They find the meetings they go to boring. So my goal, one of my missions is to help people to run meetings that are very engaging, interesting, fun, and obviously valuable. Yeah, so I'm just I just am right now working on a on a YouTube channel that's focusing in on helping smaller businesses with different topics. And so I was doing some keyword research last night. And one of the top things that you could have a YouTube video about is running a meeting. How do you run how do you run an in person yeah. meeting? How do you run a virtual meeting? And so the book that's behind me, I know you can't read the cover or anything like that but it's on overcommitment. And one of the main things that I sort of talk about in that book is this whole idea of people hopping from meeting to meeting. Yes. And then, then you have the facilitator who also could show up at the meeting, not, not prepared as well. And so I'm yeah. sure that they could engage with someone like you. Um, you, know, uh, you know, I want to check your book out. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Over it's really a hazard in terms of people doing their best in terms of communication. And most of my clients just end up saying, okay, even if I take five minutes, I say, take even two minutes. <laughs> you know, if you're in person, go to the restroom for two minutes and just do some mind over mouth planning. It's a, it's a so huge issue, this over commitment to 
a crazy schedule and it doesn't allow you time for planning or time for a reflection, right? Yeah. And it's, I mean, I, I feel like it got worse during COVID. I mean, I personally feel like there was a shift, um, you know, whenever we went to COVID that all of a sudden made people think that, you know, we don't need bathroom breaks or we don't need a full lunch period or we don't need, you know, whatever. And, okay, fine. I'm, I'm definitely somebody who works hard during the day. I, I won't deny that. I've, I've actually uh, told people as well that there are certain meals in the day that I will drink my lunch because I, you know, can't have like a traditional lunch. I've got a lot going on. However, um, there are times that we just need that sort of moment to think. And some of my clients have seen me book. I will actually book meetings with clients that I know are overcommitted and just say to them, look, I don't honestly want to meet with you. I want you to take time to prepare for our next meeting because that one is more critical. And if you show up unprepared, we're going to have, we're going to start off on a bad foot and sort of have a bad, <laughs> bad result as well. Yeah. I think that's great. And I love the title of your book. Thank you. So, I mean, literally, I don't know anyone who wouldn't relate. <laughs> yeah, well, I, hopefully it continues to sell well. It, it has it has been doing exceptionally well, you know, out there. So, yeah, I'm doing good. Um, you also have a book, though, you mentioned uh, before right. we got started. Tell me about that. I have three books. Uh, the f first two uh, were originally published uh, by... Henry Holt, and then were sold to Plume in paperback. They're still around. I would say they're more classics in the field now. One is called Smart Speaking. So one day I'll write the sequel, Stupid Speaking. <laughs> little speech joke. And then the second one is about male-female communication. It's called He and She Talk. Through the books, I had the chance to be on really wonderful TV shows like Oprah and The Today Show and uh, to talk about communication. And I think you probably find that that's one of the main things about the book is it allows you to talk more about what you do and yes. what you're passionate about. And then I wrote um, a children's book after the tragedy in Sandy Hook, Connecticut. Uh, I, I wrote a book honoring the wonderful traits of the 26 children who were killed. And it's used as a, uh, a learning tool for uh, the wonderful organization, Sandy Hook Promise. So. Oh, wow. That's amazing. That departure. Yeah. I really, I just felt like I had to do something. Yeah. It's, um, so with my grandkids, I wrote, I wrote a story as well. Um, nothing as good of a, a tribute to, um, you know, such a tragedy. Um, but I think it's important that, that children also learn storytelling and things like that. And it, it's a different sort of process going through writing a children's book versus writing a, uh, writing an, an adult fiction book. What's your book about? So um, people, some people may not like this, but um, so my, my grandchildren uh, mentioned one day at dinner that uh, Nana snored uh, and kept them up all night. And about so snoring. <laughs> it's about snoring. And then I know. Uh, that's a big issue. I don't know if it is for kids, but it certainly is for adults. So essentially, that's that's what the that's how the story takes a turn towards the end. Is that uh, the, 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 the children love making fun of the fact that their nana snores, and then all of a sudden they go to sleep and they they find out that they snore as well. So very funny. Well, speaking of storytelling, so one of the things that we we like more advanced speakers to do is tell short stories related to the business topic. Because it gives your audience a break. They usually evoke emotions. And of course, people want to do business with you often because of the emotional appeal. They may not admit it to themselves, but all other things being equal, like everyone's a genius. <laughs> everyone's right. discovering something. You know, who tells the better story? Who knows? That might, that might be decisive. Yeah, and I think about the, I mean, whether it's through any more pictures telling the story or a person telling the story, things that evoke emotion and things like that, you know, oftentimes are things that I more quickly connect to uh, as well. And it seems like you know, there's just so much that people could do better to sort of evoke, you know, emotion in their story as well. Yes. And like 
advice would be bring your personality into your meetings and presentations. Don't leave your personality at home. Right. <laughs> and, and plan, you know, if you're talking uh, about uh, a new discovery and there was something in the paper related to that discovery, don't be shy about saying, hey, and yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, there was surprise yes. people, surprise novelty stories, humor, engagement. Uh, for example, if I said, uh, Tom, when we get to the point where we're talking about um, Diet Coke, I'd love you. <laughs> You're trying to find oh, well. the label. Oh, well. There we go. Oh, well. there we I'd go. love to weigh in and talk to us about your experience and how it affects you. So I'm, I'm bringing in other people. That's another mistake people think is if they're the so-called leader of the meeting, if they call the meeting that they have to do a lot of talking, uh-uh. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen some great webinars that actually do that where they, they start off with like two questions for the audience and then they have the, you know, the audience sort of responds, you know, out of the gate. I mean, it's just, again, it depends on, I guess, whatever your format is, but I mean, whether it's a live audience or, you know, if it's one-sided like a webinar like this, you know, it becomes a little bit more challenging. You have to actually engage and make a purposeful statement to try and get people to engage as well. Right. But it's worth it. You know, there's, there's a very old saying, tell me, I'll forget. Show me, I'll remember, but involve me and I'll understand. That's so important that if there is one takeaway from this podcast, I would say it's that, that statement as well. I'd be thrilled if, if your listeners said to you, you know, I was doing all the talking. And after I listened to the podcast, I realized I don't need to do that. Uh, today, I taught a group, uh, just a simple thing, round robin. If you have 10 or less people, just go around. Uh, so let's hear where you'd like to uh, go for the holiday party. All right, let's start with the person who's worked at the company the longest, and then let's go clockwise. That way, the shy people have to be, you know, <laughs> included, and they will get used to it. And the talkative people don't dominate. Oh, so important. Yeah. And um I mean, believe it or not, I, I normally am the, la the last person that wants to speak up in those, those sort of situations as well. So I would, I would, I would much rather not, but I, you know, whenever you go one way or the other, the other thing somebody has done before in other meetings that I've been in is throw a stuffed animal or, you know, have something to pass, you know, as well in amongst the group to kind of engage people too. So. Right, right. That, that, that works. Uh, I think virtually we call it like popcorn, popcorn to someone. Oh yeah. I like, I like throwing stuff. I, <laughs> I, I tried an experiment that um, my daughter who's on my team, who's into improvisation as a tool for communication and in person, they throw a ball and each person has to catch it and then throw it a different way to the next person. Oh, I tried that. Nice. I, I'd give it a C. I don't know how good it was virtually. Yeah, I agree. Um, so then uh, are there strengths that you see in people in life sciences related to communication? Yes, I think the ability to pick up tools quickly. Number one, secondly, the ability to speak from a place of, of knowledge and passion. Yeah. is excellent. Three, a fundamental ability to be organized. Now, it may take a while before that's reflected in their speech, only because of what we've talked about before, that in general, you want to give the big picture first. Right. If it's a business case. Sure. And then drill down to what details that you want to drill down to. But the analytical part of being able to see the big picture and the details that's already there that's in place yeah absolutely so Lori, there are three questions that i like to ask every guest what inspires you well i was thinking about it one is um connection meaning meeting new people being having an energized conversation like we're having today and then the other is creativity being doing something new thinking about communication in a new and different way. And let's face it, you have, we have fodder every day. All you have to do is turn on the news. Right. And there's so much a communication coach can observe and think about. Yeah. I, it, well, it's funny. So 
it's funny that you answered in that way, right? Because one, one of the greatest things that I take away from the podcast is this ability to engage with people that I might not otherwise have an opportunity to meet, right? The second thing is that I, though, that I also try and ask really engaging questions and try and pay a lot of attention to the guests. And I find myself sort of analyzing continually the way other interviews are carried out since you brought up the news. <laughs> I had to, I wanted to follow on with this with you. So um, do you find yourself also examining your know, things as well uh, continually as a communications coach? I would imagine it, it's got to be tough because it's always coming at you. Interesting. Well, it's, it's, it's funny, you know, it's, it's that syndrome of, you know, uh, if, if you meet a plastic surgeon at a cocktail party, oh my God, he's looking at my wrinkles, you know, uh, you know, there are right. occasionally people will say, oh, 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 I really need you. Like there's nervous laughter and stuff. Sure. But the truth is, it is work. Uh, and I'll give you a funny example. Uh, you know, at work, I use a lot of expressiveness. That's what I'm hired for. You wouldn't want me to be boring. So I remember when my daughter was a little girl and I would read to her at night and I'd be uh, blah, blah, blah. And she looked at me indignantly one day and she said, mommy, talk like you talk at work. <laughs> That's interesting that she, she noticed that as well and carried it forward. So my second question for you in this series is uh, what concerns you? You know, this, this was, this is a really easy one for me. Uh, what concerns me is lack of kindness in mm. communication uh and anything that's not kind i'd love to start a whole movement uh where speech coaches people in my field become more aware and call people out for not for for not being kind for being abusive um for bullying etc it, it's a, it's a big problem words words are powerful and then i guess the flip side of it would be how to how to promote and teach people, especially little kids who are, you know, very influenced about kindness, what helps people, what hurts people. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that. And then lastly, what excites you? What excites me is a new client or a new situation. Cause I'm, I love the initial meeting, the energy that comes with it, the problem solving, the having to prove myself and then laying laying out a plan and hoping that there's a good connection and that I'm able to go farther and help the client or the team. So as we get ready to wrap up, um, I will of course post all the links to, uh, to get to you, but if anybody's listening right now, I'd like to reach out right now. What's the best way to get in touch with you? Sure. I would, I would say, my daughter says I have the longest email of that on the face of the earth. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, but I know it'll be on the link. Uh, it's Lori and it's L A U R I E Lori at Partners in Communication Inc I N C dot com. Yeah, no, no one gets it the first time. Partners in Communication Inc dot com. And then I I sent over to you a couple of things. One is free access to my online course, Conquer Your Fear of Speaking. It's a course, everybody. It's not like a one, two, three thing. You, it's a course that you take in, uh, you know, over time. Perfect. It's all online. And so when the, th this weekend, this, this episode will post uh, to all of the audio platforms, I'll have Lori's webpage up on the lifesciencesuccess.com page. And so you can find the link there. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you, Lori, for being a guest on the Life Science Success Podcast. It is my pleasure. Keep speaking for success and all the good things you do in the world, everyone. Thank you for listening to Life Science Success. For complete details about this podcast, including show notes, how to get in touch with guests, and more episodes, please visit www.lifesciencesuccess.com. If there's someone you'd like for us to invite to the show as a guest, please let me know by sending me a message at the podcast website. Please click subscribe on your favorite podcast app, share the podcast or tell a friend about it. And last but not least, rate the podcast. Thank you again. <music>